So uh, good morning. Um, today we're going to be talking about some cyber ethics stuff. But the first thing to I want to say is there I did successfully post the uh, Blackboard discussion question this week. So if you haven't had a chance to do that yet, feel free to uh, get that done ASAP. Um, I haven't, I'm not going to take off any points if you get it done in the next day or so, because last week I forgot to post it. So I can't expect for you to remember it every week, but just know that it's up there and get it done as soon as you can, if you haven't done it yet. Um, that's the only point of business. Does anyone have any business questions or concerns of their own? If not, we can jump right into the material. All right. So. What's today's topic, given what it says on the syllabus and what you had to read for this week? What's the topic today? Cybersecurity, exactly. Cyber security. Simply put, what is cybersecurity? So cyber crimes actually next week, Rogelio. Um, or this week is cybersecurity or security in cyberspace. So what is cybersecurity or security in cyberspace? And we're going to be touching on some cybercrime things. And then next week is going to be more focused exclusively on cybercrime. But what is the definition of cybersecurity? If you were to put this in your own words, I'm sure you've heard people talk about cybersecurity before. What did they, what do you think it is that they're talking about? Ways to secure information from hackers. Annabelle says that that's one big one. Security concerns involving IT. That's another big way of putting it. So the idea here is we've got this notion of secure or security, and then it's in a cyber sort of situation. Information protection, computers and networking. Jasmine, you're spot on. All of these things are what we're talking about with cybersecurity. So really to understand cybersecurity, we've already talked about the cyber bit or the IT bit. The question then is, what do we mean by security? So what is security? What is it to make something secure? And last week, somebody actually gave the definition of, uh, I can't remember who it was, so I apologize, but somebody actually gave the three-part definition of what goes into security. Um, they gave it in a cybersecurity context. Yeah, Shot says C-I-A. So... CIA. These are the things that have to do with security. And now, by um, okay, Sammy, uh, no worries. Um, I was wondering where Annabelle came from, but yeah, so uh, yeah, somebody else said it. So good job giving credit. I can't remember who said it, but yeah, it's CIA. Now, the CIA is the part, part of the government responsible for keeping us secure, but in this context, it's an acronym where each of these three things stands for one of the parts that goes into security. So to bring out this idea of CIA or the three things that go into cybersecurity, let's, well, let's talk about security generally and then talk about what goes into being secure. So rather than going about this through the typical sort of cyber approach, um, let's just figuring out what these letters stand for, or I guess, does anyone know off the top of their head what the three letters stand for? And then we'll explain what they mean with an example. Is that- Confidentiality is the first one, yes. Integrity and uh, avail availability, I think? Yeah, availability or accessibility. I've heard it both ways. I'm gonna put up availability. I, I don't think this is how you spell availability or accessibility. Ability, confidentiality, and integrity. So rather than going about defining these words, let's instead look at a case in which um, we have security or security is at issue. And we can see how each of these things goes into security. So um, the zombie apocalypse. Imagine the zombie apocalypse is happening. Um, everyone knows what I mean by the zombie apocalypse. The virus breaks out. There's zombies everywhere. We're basically in the walking dead. Um, so if the zombie apocalypse breaks out, where right now, just imagine you hear on the news, there's been a zombie outbreak. Uh, there, the disease is spreading across New York City. The way you get it is you get bit by a zombie. Where would you personally go at that point? What would you do?
Costco. So we have one vote for Costco. Where are some places that other people would go? Where would you go if the zombie apocalypse came? Get on a ship, a cruise ship, an army base. The mountains, you try to fly. Um, now let's go through these. Why would you go to these places? So um, uh, Scott says evacuate to another country. Why would you evacuate to another country? What would be the advantage? If you're in another country, what is the benefit here? Because I think that's a good idea. In order to survive, and what about going to another country would help you? Yeah, you're away from the zombies. Another way of putting this is they physically cannot hurt you if you're in another place. Same idea with a ship. Why would you go on a ship? Well, if you're on a ship, you are far away. Another way of saying this is that your body is physically secure. An island is another good one, um, as long as they can't swim. So Assuming they can't swim, we don't actually know if they can't swim, but at the very least, we know they walk. So assuming that they can't swim, yeah, you go to these places. So the first thing you'd want to do is physically separate yourself because if they, you are physically separated from someone, they cannot physically harm you. In a, another way of putting this is that in that situation, you have physical integrity. You are physically protected from what somebody else is going to try to do. They cannot damage you. The zombies cannot hurt you. So one of the things you want to do in the zombie apocalypse is get someone you're far away. Integrity here just means that the way things are stay the way they are and nothing is damaging them. So this is what we mean by integrity in this context. And that's one of the things that we intuitively think of where why we go to a ship or why we go to an island. Now, what's the advantage of Costco? Who said Costco? I can't remember. Rami said Costco. Why would you want to go to a Costco? Because I think that's another good idea. What does Costco give you during the zombie apocalypse? Food and medicine and resources. Exactly. So in that case, they also have toilets, things that you'd want. So in this case, on the one hand, you don't want the zombies coming and hurting you, but there are still things you need access to or you need to have available. So part of being secure during the zombie apocalypse is not just keeping the zombies out. It's getting access to the things that you need to survive. So this is the second bit of it. It's not just that the ships, or uh, if you're on a ship, it will be good as long as it's a supplied ship. But on the other hand, if the ship runs out of food after a while, you're kind of screwed. So this is kind of a balancing act of with security, you need availability, to what you need and you need the people who need to have access to you, be able to access you and you need to have access to the information you need. But you also need for the things on the outside, the things that you don't want interacting with you to also stay on the outside. So it's about getting the good things in, the keeping the bad things out. And this is really the give and take of security. Now, where does confidentiality fit in? What does it mean for something to be confidential? That nobody has access to it? So it's not just that nobody has access to you. It's so the, what then is the difference? So integrity also has to be access to you. So what's the difference then between integrity and confidentiality? If we said integrity is physically interacting with you, what's the key difference with confidentiality? Yeah, it's about secrets or information. So if you are, if you have integrity in a system, what it means is nothing is physically damaging it. If you have confidentiality, it's that nobody knows what's going on inside of it. And you can see that these two come apart. You could have a zombie who accidentally hurts you without even knowing you're there. And also you can have a zombie that knows you're there without actually hurting you. So what you want in a perfectly secure system is you also don't want anyone on the outside knowing what's going on in the inside. So in the case of the zombie apocalypse, What's the advantage of a Costco versus like a glass building? What is it that a glass building doesn't give you that Costco does, which makes Costco a slightly safer place during the zombie apocalypse? If the building's made out of glass, what can the zombies do? They can break it, that's one thing, but also just as importantly, they can see through the glass and see if anyone's in there. 
If you're in a Costco with like cement walls, they might not even know you're in there to come after you. So the idea here is a, the most safe place you can be during any sort of zombie apocalypse is somewhere where the zombies can't see you. So they can't even know to try to get to you. They can't physically get to you. Your body is safe. You have physical integrity, but you have availability or access to all the things you need to survive during the zombie apocalypse. And so what you have with a system that is perfectly secure is these are well balanced. You and anyone else who needs access to you can get access to you. You have access to all the resources you need while also ensuring that those resources and you yourself are not damaged or physically altered, but also no one even knows what's happening on the inside. Because if no one knows what's happening, it's even harder for them to get to you, to interact with you, to harm you. So that's a case of what, where this CIA comes from. If you have confidentiality, integrity, and you have availability of what you need, your system, be it a physical system, your body is secure. So let's apply this to a cyber case because it carries over in the exact same way with a computer system. What is it then for a computer system to have confidentiality, integrity, and availability? So when your computer system is, a, is secure or your computer is secure, in what way is your computer confidential? Yet yeah, your files could be encrypted. So nobody can get information. Another big one is a password. Nobody can read what's on your computer if it's password protected and they don't know the password. And the point is that if there's a lot of things I'm sure on your computer or on your phone that you wouldn't necessarily want somebody to see or to get access to. How many of you have done banking on your phone? Like taking a picture of a check so you didn't have to go to the bank. Yeah, I have as well. It's a lot simpler. But what's the downside? Well, if somebody were to be able to see that, they could then get your bank account information. So the first thing you want to do is make sure that your bank account information is secure. Also, if you have things on there like your social security number or anything like that, or even, you know, who you're talking to. If you don't want your mom knowing that you're talking to her arch enemy's son, then, you know, you want to keep that confidential. Now, what about integrity? What is it? for a computer system to have integrity. Confidentiality is for no one to know what's written on there. Integrity, so part of it's gonna be software updates and what do the software updates do or what do the hashes do? What, what do they prevent from happening? If you have integrity, just definitionally, what does it mean when your system has integrity? So all of you, so uh, Shad and Daniel, you're giving me actually a more complicated answer that I'm looking for. You're giving me examples of ways to ensure that you have integrity. But I'm just trying to ask an even dumber question, which is, yeah, what is it for it to have in integrity? It's exactly what Daniel said. Make sure that nothing has been manipulated in your computer. So for instance, a cat on a keyboard, like if you walk away from your keyboard and your cat just walks all over your document and saves it, in a certain sense, your information is still confidential because the cat doesn't read unless you have like a magic cat that can read or speak. Your information is still private, but it's been altered. It's been damaged. It's been changed. There's the system it no longer has integrity. If you're trying to code something and your cat steps all over the keyboard, your program's not gonna work anymore, even if the cat doesn't know what it did. So in a certain sense, what we need is we need integrity in the system. So what's in there isn't just private, but it's left undamaged or unchanged. And the way we can do that is to ensure that we have things like software updates to make sure that bugs are improved and things like that. Now, finally, with a computer system, what is it, when is a computer system have accessibility or have availability? What does that mean in the case of a computer system? So we said confidentiality. So yeah, being online is one aspect of it. It's, yeah, it's, and this is the key, that you have access to your files or who's supposed to be, have access to it. So you only, your computer system's no longer in a certain sense secure if you can no longer get to the information you need on it. And so most, just to give an example, most of the time with uh, cybersecurity attacks, 
for most of history, the attack has been on confidentiality or integrity. Someone tries to get in the system and change things around, or someone tries to get your credit card information or things like that. But ransomware attacks, which we talked about in the past few classes, cases in which someone encrypts your files unless you give them uh, a ransom, that's a case in which somebody is exploiting the third bit. They are making sure that you don't have access to your own system. So a, a system, a computer system is only secure when your information is confidential from other people on the outside. Your information cannot be altered. It is safe. It is protected. And then you, however, have access to the things you need access to. So that's all we mean by cybersecurity. When you're when you have confidentiality, integrity, and accessibility in your computer or your computer network or your computer system or your entire network of systems. Um, does all that make sense? This should in some sense be rather common sense or intuitive. All right, so that's the idea with confidentiality, integrity, availability, accessibility, whatever, CIA. Now, the rest of class, what I wanna talk about then is basically, if we know very straightforwardly what cybersecurity is and how all three parts go into it, what I want to talk about now then is just what are some of the ways in which we keep cyber systems secure? I just want to list off some of the methods we use and then discuss if we've got all these methods and everyone values security, why is it then that hacks are constantly happening? And why is it that we need to take the time to talk about these things. So first off, what are some of the ways that we keep computer systems secure? Some of them you've already said, a VPN. So yeah, really what I wanna do is just talk about some of the systems just so we're familiar with it, exploring them, updates. Because one of the major takeaways of this class period today is that it's incredibly hard for a computer system to stay secure. And because of this, you personally have to put a lot of effort in, in ways that you might not even be aware of. So in a certain sense, today's class, and some of you will know all of this stuff, but others, it's kind of gonna be a, like a practical class on how to keep your computer system secure. So let's talk about what all these things are. What is a VPN? Who wants to explain a VPN to everybody else? I try to do it sometimes and it doesn't go well, so I'm gonna leave it to people who can explain it better than I can. So the definition is a virtual private network. So vir V virtual, P private, and network. What does a virtual private network actually do or how does it work? Okay, it's like a tunnel. So say a little more. Yeah, it basically, yeah, it changes your IP address. So what is an IP address? Well, basically to get on the computer, what you have to do is like your computer doesn't like have a name like you do when it interacts on the internet. It instead has a little number that is unique to your location. So what a VPN does is it basically, in, it, instead of having your actual location show up, what it does is it makes a different IP address appear so that somebody who's looking from the outside does not actually know who it is that's accessing it. It basically just masks what the location is or what the IP address is of your computer. So these are not actual IP addresses, but imagine your IP address were actually 99. Again, that doesn't fit the form of an IP address, but just pretend because I don't feel like writing up a lot of numbers. Well, this might make it look like 88. And therefore, if somebody's trying to find your information and they know you're 99, they won't find you because you're being hit under a different number. So that's one way. And one of the things that a VPN is very good is it really improves your confidentiality. What are, we, what are updates? And this is in the simple sense of like your computer asks you to update. It can be a software update. It can be an operating system update. Basically, what do updates do and why are they important other than just to annoy you? Yeah. Bug fixes. So basically, those of you who are coders said this last week, it's impossible to make any code without bugs. Now, because of this, it's important that when a program is released, a company might not realize there are bugs on it immediately. 
And these bugs can make uh, security. It can mean that the, the existence of this bug might threaten your computer's integrity. And so, yeah, so Shad says updates make it hard for hackers to exploit because it fixes the bad code. And that's exactly it. The point of an update is not just to make things run more smoothly. It's rather that very often there's going to be a bug in the code the company didn't know was there when they initially produced it. Someone will find out. And what the purpose of the update will do is basically it closes that bug. You can think of it using a physical metaphor as imagine if you didn't realize that the lock on your door was broken. Well, what are you going to do if you realize the lock on your door is broken and you don't want people breaking in? Well, who do you call? Yeah, you change the lock or call the locksmith. And so in the same way, that's what, in some sense, uh, an update is. It basically, someone learns that there's a broken lock in the system. The update, one of the things it does is it serves to fix this problem. Antiviruses, what do antivirus software do? So it, it's, yeah, it scans and protects for malware. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about what malware is. But what malware basically is, well, what's the definition of malware? M-A-L-M-A-L-W-A-R-E. What's the technical definition of malware? Bad software, yeah. Basically, it's malicious software. It's software, it's a small to large program that was entirely designed to do something bad. Um, so that's all that malware is. It's malicious software, malware. So what an antivirus does is it scans your computer to see if there's any malware that has been installed on it. And then depending on the program, delete any information that's on there. And you can see how this is basically the point of an antivirus is to learn if there's anything affecting the integrity of your system. Strong passwords. What is the purpose of a strong password? What does it do? And by strong password here, I literally just mean like the thing you type in to get access to your computer. What is it that a strong password gives you? Yeah, it's hard to crack. So basically, um, you want to make sure that you can get onto your computer, but also that no one else can. And what is a dictionary attack? Shad brings up dictionary attack, which is a very good thing to know. What is a dictionary attack? It's uh, when uh, a hacker tries uh, multiple passwords to, to try to log in into a system. Yeah, it's basically what it does is you just go down a list of common passwords, or you could write a program that basically takes all the words of the dictionary in certain orders and enters them in, in your, as your password to see if it'll get in. And so one of the easiest ways to get into a computer system is you just try a lot of common passwords because the most common passwords are very often very stupid sorts of things that are very easy to guess. So for instance, um, 12345 is a very common one. Also, if you pick up someone's phone and you see that it's locked with a four digit code, what's your guess on what that code's gonna be? If you had to choose one number, what would you guess? One, two, three, four is a good guess. Zero, 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 zero is another one. What if you, what if you, hello is another good one. Um, password is common. But if you know what their birthday is, a lot of people just use their birthday as their four number passcode. So if you know what their birthday is, you can always try that. Last phone digits are another one. So all of these are very easy. And if you basically, if you have a very easy to guess password, then you're no longer confidential and you no longer have integrity. Finally, user privilege. What is user privilege? Yeah, so you basically control who has access to the system. So some people, you control who can give, uh, basically in a computer system, administrator access, is somebody, someone with administrative access is allowed to do a lot more to the computer system, change things around that the average person cannot. So if you've got a big computer network in like an office, like a local area network that's in an office building, the average employee is not going to be able to go into the system and change around a lot of different things. Only someone with administrator access can do that. 
So if you restrict who has administrator access and who can get, um, the more people with administrative access, the more people have the potential to change the computer system around. So one thing is you prevent anyone from having administrative access or you keep the number small so that if one of these people gets hacked or if they lose control of their system, the entire overall network is not broken. So these are all the way, some of the ways in which you can keep a computer network secure. Um, other ways that companies, we can, well, we're gonna be talking over the next couple of weeks about how companies do this. So we've got this idea then of what security is. We know some of the ways in which companies keep people secure. So here's another question. How many of you care about computer security? How many of you value that your computer system is secure? I do, I certainly do. It seems like just about everybody does. There's no one who's like, I want strangers to steal all my information. So no one, um, no one is completely ambivalent about it. So what we have is a definition. We have a definition of what security is. We have a collection of, of tools for keeping things secure. And we have a lot of people who want to keep them secure. So then here's a simple question. If you were to name the most secure things in the world, like things that you think are the safest things imaginable. What are some of the examples you give? Be they systems or places or anything like that. And I'm not talking about computers here. So the Mona Lisa, yeah, a bunker. These are all things that are very well protected. The Pentagon. Where on the list does my home computer fall? Is it up near the top of the very safe things or is it down near the bottom? Yeah, it's last. So here's this issue. We want our computer system secure. We know some of the things that keep it secure. We know how, what security entails. And yet on the whole, computer systems are very not secure. So what gives? It's what we call a paradox. We have two things that seem like they couldn't both be true at the same time, and yet they are. So here's the simple question that I want to spend the next bit of time talking about. Why are computers so damn insecure? And there's a lot of factors that go into it, but it's worth knowing what these factors are. Because if you recognize the inherent problems in computer systems and why it's so hard to keep them secure, you can do a bit better about keeping yourself and your own things secure. And also, you will then know if you go and work in a cyber uh, security company or any sort of software development or anytime you're working with computers, you will have a better idea of what the problems are that you're going to be facing to keep a computer system secure. So let us discuss a bunch of reasons of why it's so damn hard to keep a computer system secure. So let's just start writing down numbers and talking about some of the ways. So I'm just going to put the numbers up here and then we can fill them in. So what is one of the reasons? And there's, I've got listed down and I've, the way I divide it is not like a universal, but there are many different ways to divide this up. But I have six written down, six factors that make computer security so damn difficult. Anyone wanted to start throwing out reasons that cybersecurity is so damn hard. Lack of awareness. So, lack of awareness. So this is a big one. What do we mean by lack of awareness here? Because you're spot on. But what do we mean here by lack of awareness? Who lacks awareness? Yeah, most regular users of a computer system do not understand what is required to keep a system secure and how it works. So contrast the difference between, um, contrast the system between like a, a physical door or a wall. How does a wall work? A wall is probably the greatest invention in security history. How many of you could explain to your parents what a wall does? And I don't mean a firewall, I don't mean a computer wall, I mean like a physical this thing. Like this thing here. 
Yeah, it keeps, it blocks people from seeing and it keeps them out. Is it hard for anybody to understand how a wall works? I'm, like, have you ever met anyone who's like, I don't understand walls? Like, how do they, no, everyone gets walls. How many of you think you could explain to your grandma how a firewall works in a way that she would be able to understand? Like, I'm gonna guess many of you are quite computer literate and very good. <laughs> so Shad says it's a wall with fire, so it burns bad software. So right there, I think is a very nice definition of what it does. But like, let me tell you, my father does not understand the word software. He does not understand what a computer program is other than it's the thing he clicks on that allows him to do stuff. But he couldn't really understand how it is. And he'd ask something like, where is this fire? Where is it built? Where does it exist? I can see a physical wall, but I, can I see a firewall? Something else, if you talk to a person over the age of say 70 and ask them about passwords, what is the first thing they say about their passwords? It's usually not, I recognize that it's important for security. What is it that they usually say? I'm not sure if any, many of you are interacting with grandparents using computers or older parents using computers. But generally, let me tell you, the only thing my parents say about their passwords is um, either how do I type it in or I can't remember any of my passwords or does anyone have a parent like my parents who literally right next to their computer have a sheet of paper with all their usernames and passwords written down because they just cannot remember them? Yeah, a lot of people have this. And the reason why is because the nature of computers, um, yeah, exactly. Tiffany says her parents can't remember any of their passwords and expect me to remember them. I have the same issue. Also, I cannot remember, like count the number of times I've had to call my parents or a friend for the, uh, for the Netflix password because nobody ever remembers the damn Netflix password. So because of this, because it can be such a, um, because it can be so frustrating to try to remember these things, what we end up doing is cutting these corners and making our passwords less strong. So even on the one hand, like even those of us who know the importance of strong passwords will often not have strong passwords because it's such a pain in the ass. And if you don't even know, like for those of us who know, we still aren't always the best with passwords. But for people who don't even know what the purpose of these passwords are, like I'd be willing to bet there are certain people who just think the purpose of a password is just to like, it's the numbers that start the program or something like that, not realizing that it's the importance of keeping it safe. Another issue though, is a lot of other types of attacks, people don't even know that this might be a scam or it might be a, um, some sort of virus. That's another major issue is people don't even know what it is that they need to do. Another one is how many people know parents who don't understand why computers have to update? Like I know that my parents never update their computer because they don't even comprehend the idea of why a computer update would be needed. Like all my parents ever do whenever there's a computer update is complain that things are different than they used to be. They cannot understand the importance of these updates for keeping the network or the system secure. So this lack of awareness is majorly a problem. Another one is that, you know, if you don't know what goes into a security system, you're not going to do what's necessary to put that in place. So if you don't understand the importance of antivirus software or understand what it does, you're not going to get antivirus software. If you don't know what a firewall does, you're not going to be worried when you don't have a firewall. If you don't have anything encrypted, if you don't even know what encryption is, you're not going to be worried that your files aren't encrypted. So one of the major issues is, unlike the average person who understands what walls do and why locks on your doors are important, the average computer user doesn't know what they need to keep a computer system secure. So 
it would be like somebody who has a house, but they don't put walls on it because they don't understand the importance of keeping things out. In the same way, many people though, so in that case, everyone understands walls, but much of the time, people aren't gonna understand the importance of firewalls or even understand what they are, so they don't put them in place. So that's one of the major issues with why computer systems aren't secure. It's a difference between physical space and, or I mean, our understanding of the physical world and our understanding of computer worlds. Um, what are some other reasons that uh, it's so damn hard to keep computer systems secure? New exploits. So one thing we can say here is, um, it's a good way of putting this. I'm just going to put up new exploits comes in with the fact that computers are technically complex and computer systems are technically complex. And because they're technically complex, new exploits and new bugs can crop up left and right. So there are going to be other classes you can take in which you get into the nitty gritty of the technical complexities of a computer system. But you can really just with a simple diagram understand why it's so difficult to keep a computer system secure. And one of the major issues is, well, one is just that like software is difficult and therefore writing bug free software is very, very difficult, which means that there are going to be new exploits and new bugs that can be exploited. So for instance, the difference is like, how, how many of you think that if I gave you $1,000 and a trip to Home Depot, you could build a physical wall. It doesn't have to be a good wall, it just has to be a wall that would keep like your average small dog out. You can have YouTube too to teach you how to do it. You have YouTube, a trip to Home Depot and a thousand dollars. How many of you think you could build some type of wall? I think I could build a wall. I mean, it wouldn't be the best wall, but I think it would do a decent job keeping things out. So. I would bet many of us could at least build something like a wall. How many of you feel that you could build, if I just gave you, you know, however much money and however much time you needed, and I asked you, design a firewall for this system that will keep out things as well as your physical wall would keep out people, how many of you think you could do it successfully? So those of you who have a coding background might be able to do it. I certainly could not. But compare this now with a like the average population. In the average population, I'd say most people could build something resembling a, a physical wall. But a very, very small percentage of people could build a successful firewall. And I think that's a major difference is the amount of technical expertise you need to build, I mean, to build a really successful house, you need technical expertise. But to build even the most basic structure, I think everybody could, with enough time, some money, some nails and things, build something that at least resembles a wall, a physical wall. But I don't think the average person could get anywhere close to designing anything that even looks remotely like a firewall without years of training, just because the technical complexities are much, much different. Um, and another issue, which I think ties into number three, is, well, actually, let me, I'm trying to think, the line between two and three is a little blurry. Um, Uh, imagine you had a uh, thousand dollars in a bag, like just a thousand bucks or a little wad of cash under your pillow. What would somebody have to do to steal your thousand dollars? You have it under your pillow. What would someone have to do? Break into your house. So where would they have to be to steal your money from under your pillow? And this is like, I'm this in your room, exactly, yeah. They have to physically be in your room. Now imagine by contrast, you have $1,000 in your Venmo account. 
You've got $1,000 just sitting there as like your Venmo balance is $1,000. Where would somebody have to be to take that money? So they have to hack into your account. And where can they do that from? Anywhere. This is a fundamental difference is with computer systems, the nature of a computer system, especially one connected to the internet, is such that attacks can happen from anywhere physically. As long as you are connected to the computer network, you can get access to the things on that network from anywhere in the world. This is just a fundamental difference from physical break-ins versus digital break-ins. To steal your money on Venmo, somebody can do it from halfway around the world. To steal your money from under your pillow, you have to do it from literally within your bedroom. Why does that matter? What is the significance of the difference in space in that way? Why is this at all relevant? What is it that you can do it from anywhere makes it much easier or much less, I guess, much less safe. So one issue is that it can be harder to get into your room than it is to get into cyberspace. But even let's put that aside. Let's imagine that you just have a really good security system and you've got a pretty good strong door on your bedroom. Even if we assume they're both equally secure, what's the difference as soon as you say anyone can attack from anywhere? Well, let's just, how big is your bedroom? Just think about how big your bedroom is. You don't have to tell me how big it is. Just think about it. So Daniel puts it into the correct uh, digital terms, which is too many attack vectors. But before we define exactly what that means of what we mean by attack vector, let's just go at it in this like physical analogy way of imagine your bedroom. How many people at one time could try to break into your bedroom? Just like approximate. How many people physically could try to get into your bedroom at the same time? Yeah, like two, maybe three. How many people could simultaneously try to hack into your Venmo account? Many, yeah, basically an endless amount. Now there's a certain number where maybe the system will shut down, but at the very least, because you can approach it from anywhere and it's not controlled by physical space, one consequence of this is that a huge number of people can ask, try to access your account. So it's just the number of attacks or the number of different ways to approach, or I think it was Daniel who used the term um, attack vector. That's not how you spell attack. What an attack vector is, is just a fancy way of saying the approach of the attack or the place from which the attack happens or the, the direction or the pathway by which someone attacks. With a physical space, if your room, there's only a certain number of windows and a certain number of doors that you have to protect. With a computer system, because it's all interconnected globally, somebody can try to get into your network from so many different parts of the globe in so many different ways. So there's just so much more to attack than there is in a physical space. Another issue with this tied in with the technically complex is the attack. So the attack vectors are much larger in number, but also the attack surface is bigger. So do people know what is meant by the attack surface? Have people heard this expression before? It's basically, if the attack vector are the places that people are coming from, the surface of attack or the, air, the, the attack surface is basically all the parts of the interconnected network from which an attack can occur. So the attack surface of a physical bedroom is the literal physical space into which someone can come across. And that's quite limited by the size of your apartment. With a computer network though, where everything is interconnected, any part of the interconnected network that would allow you to connect to any other part of the network is a potential point of attack or a potential weakness. So contrast the case with say, imagine a computer that's never been connected to the internet. It's never been connected to a local area network. It doesn't even have say a Wi-Fi port or an ethernet cable. 
So all it is is basically just stuff stored on a hard drive. And this is how computers, you know, used to be before we the internet was around. What would you need to do to get onto this computer and get into this system? Where would you have to go to get there? It's not connected to the internet, old fashioned computer system. You have to get to the physical computer. So the, what we could say is that the attached surface or the space that could be attacked is just as the user access to the computer. Contrast that now with your average laptop. So right now you are probably at a laptop or a phone. So let's just draw a phone because it's a box and it's simpler. Now, one way I could access what's on your phone is to physically take your phone from you and open it up. But is that the only way I can get into your phone? Or get access to what's on your phone? No, what are some other ways you can get in? Well, what is your phone, assuming you're on Wi-Fi right now, what is your phone connected to? Yeah, it's, well, so it's first gonna be connected to your local area network and the router there. So here's your Wi-Fi box. And your Wi-Fi box is also gonna be connected to other computers on this network. So say your mom's in the other room on her phone. They're now connected here to this. This is then going to be connected up into the internet, which is itself, or actually there's gonna be some steps along the way. This is a very basic version of it. But what you see is your phone now is not just dependent on itself for security. You also have to be protected from people on your mother's phone because if your mom's phone gets hacked and then they upload something onto the Wi-Fi uh, or onto the router, which can then be down, uh, uploaded onto your phone, you can download it from this uh, network or somebody on that Wi-Fi network might just, through access to this, take information that's coming off of your phone. So. Your mom's phone is now a point of weakness. The Wi-Fi network is, and that's not even mentioning once we get involved with the, the internet, which is itself not something that's, um, you know, it's not like the internet is just a thing in the clouds. It exists as a collection of smaller networks being associated through other smaller um, server spaces and things like that. So the internet is itself gonna be many different places that could potentially get access. There's also, because of all this network connection, there's physical ethernet or uh, physical fiber optic cables that run under the ocean between different nations that the internet information gets passed along. So if somebody wanted to hack into those physical cables, that's another way they could get to your information. So there's just countless different ways because the network is so complicated and can exist interconnectedly around the world. Even if you have the best security system, there's still the fact that just the amount of space that can be attacked and the number of people who could potentially be doing the attacking is just so much larger than anything elsewhere, any other piece of technology. So it's basically that the very exact same things that make the internet so powerful and so useful, the fact that you can communicate on Zoom from halfway across the city or go on WhatsApp and talk from halfway around the world, at the very same time, make the network very insecure. Because if you can access your grandmother, a hacker can access your grandmother. If you, anywhere on this system is a weak point, and if anyone finds that weak point, they can get access to your computer, your system, et cetera. Does that make sense to everyone of how the, just the very nature of computer systems, and especially an internet computer system that makes it powerful, also makes it incredibly, incredibly, by its very nature, insecure. So yeah, that's why many people started to use virtual systems. And so yeah, there are ways in which people are trying to get around this, but what, and I think what Jim just brought up, another nice thing that this illustrates is the degree to which you have to understand the technical details to put, make yourself safe is well beyond what's cap the capability of your average 56 year old person. Um, 56 maybe, but like 75, your average 75 year old person is not gonna be able to do the things that are needed 
to get around these interconnected issues. Here's another way in which the physical rules are different. Um, imagine you've got a case. Let's contrast two cases. I'm gonna draw things up here. This is my best work, but it'll get the job done. What am I drawing? So yeah, that's an elephant. This is my terrible elephant. <laughs> and then what's this? Can anyone tell what this is? It's a bug of some sort, a beetle, an ant. I'm just gonna call it a cockroach. So these are two things that, um, how many of you would like to have a cockroach in your living room? How many of you really love having cockroaches in your living room? Does anybody really love it when there's a cockroach in the living room? All right, how many of you would really like to have an elephant in your living room? And, I, and I, to be clear, it's not a well-behaved elephant. It is like your average just, it doesn't know how it got here and it's a little frightened. So we've got two things we don't want in the living room. Now, the elephant and the cockroach, which one would actually be worse to have in your living room? The elephant would be worse, why? It's huge. Yeah, exactly. The elephant's going to run around and smash things. The cockroach can do some damage, but it's relatively small. So the bigger the thing, the bigger the damage it can do. But on the flip side, which of these is easier to keep out? How many of you have had a cockroach in your apartment? Raise your hand if you had a cockroach in your apartment. I've had a roach. How many of you have had an elephant in your apartment? Yeah, what's the major difference here? Why have you seen, or to even do this, we can even contrast the difference between say a rat and a cockroach. Even if you've had rats, I feel like cockroaches are still somewhat more common. And why is it that mice are more common than rats and cockroaches are more common than mice? Generally speaking, what's the difference here? The smaller the thing is, the easier it is for it to get in, but also the smaller a thing is, the less damage it can do. Now, this is the way the physical world works, generally speaking. There are some examples like COVID, which are very small and do a lot of damage. But generally speaking, the bigger something is, the more damage it can do in a physical space. But now think about computers. Think about a computer system. Does the size of the bug make any difference? Does the size of the program make any difference? Shot has given me the credit, yeah. No, the size of the bug or the size of the like flaw in the system can be incredibly small. And yet the amount of damage it can do is incredibly large. So that's another issue is with a house, you can look and see what the major potential problems are. You can see, oh, there's a giant gaping hole in my wall. I have to patch that. With a computer system, it's much harder to see the potential weaknesses because a very, very small weakness can be a very, very big problem. So that's another major issue here, is it's basically imagine, you can think of what are computer systems like, imagine things that start as the size of cockroaches, but as soon as they get into your apartment, transform into elephants. And that's what you're dealing with with computer systems. Computer systems are incredibly difficult to know where the real, real issues are. It can be a little tiny issue that's very hard to notice that has a huge technical problem behind it. And to recognize this fact, you have to be a technologi blah, 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 technologically knowledgeable person to even be able to understand that point. Um, all right, so those are our first three reasons that computer systems are very insecure. There's a lack of awareness by users, they're incredibly technically complex, and they follow different physical rules and are interconnected in ways the physical world is not, so that our typical ways of keeping things safe don't work well on the internet. The sorts of things that the average person can know to keep a physical space safe do not apply in the computer case. All right. 
What are some other reasons that computer systems are so insecure? So yeah, Jim says a termite couldn't destroy the house, but a hundred could definitely easily do it. And that's another reason why termites are so deadly is because you can't see them down low and they're in the, like, you don't know they're there until they've eaten the house away. But the other nice thing about termites is if you have a thousand of them, you're more likely to identify one of them. And one of them alone isn't gonna be able to destroy the house. With a computer bug though, or a piece of malware, even a, the equivalent of a single termite would be able to eat your house away if it's the right type of termite and it's the right sort of gap in the system. What are some other reasons that computer systems are so damn hard to keep secure? Does anyone have any ones they wanna throw up here? I've got three more that I wanna talk about, but um, let's just talk a little computer history. automated. So I'm actually going to, let's talk about Shad's one here of automation. So IT can be automated. What does that mean? Well, it's carried out by a program instead of a person doing the, uh, the actual controlling of the system. And why is this a problem? Or how does this make a security system less secure? Well, I think it kind of, it's one that's worth highlighting because it ties into some other things. If a system is automated, then it's hard for the average person to recognize when it's not running correctly. Also, if you are, have a physical user looking at a system and seeing it run, then what can this physical user notice if things aren't going right? That was a terrible way of asking that question. What I was trying to say is if you've got a physical like IT professional working on a system, if things aren't running right, they're probably going to be able to recognize that things aren't running right. But if everything is automated, what can happen is things can be running the wrong way for a while before anyone notices the problem. So that's another issue with the different physical rules is because things are automated, they can problems can crop up and not be noticed for quite some time. And as long as the system is doing what, what it's supposed to be doing correctly. So if you've got a computer program that's supposed to be doing your accounting, as long as it's doing the accounting correctly, you might not notice for a long time that it's also got a security issue in it. So does that make sense to everyone? I think that's a really good point, Chuck. All right, let's talk some computer history. The computer, the personal computer started coming into existence. Does anyone know when they really started cropping up in houses on a relatively decent number? And I, I'm not saying like 90% of people had computers, but when did computers start to really, yeah, it was like the 80s and 90s. So the 80s and 90s. Now at this time, were these computers connected to the internet? No, they were not. In fact, the only people who had access to anything like the internet was the government. And so these computers were being designed assuming that they were only gonna exist by themselves in a localized space. So if you actually read computer security uh, manuals from the 90s for like business manuals, they say, make sure to keep your computer network or co your computers secure and all the information on them secure. Does anyone, can anyone guess what the number one thing they'd say to do to make sure your computers were secure was? But this is pre-internet being everywhere. What was the number one sort of thing that they, these things? Shutdown was one. So that was a big one, but even more general than this. Make sure other users don't use it. And how would you do this? What was the main thing that these companies would have in their manuals? How, what's the best way to make sure other people aren't using it? And not just other people at the firm. So password was one, but even more generally than a password. What was the number one thing they were afraid of? Not that somebody would come in and access your computer while you weren't there. What were they more afraid of? Yeah, lock it. In the physical sense of the number one thing people were worried about was people coming in and stealing the physical computer and taking it somewhere else. That was the number one worry. And computers were built and operating systems that were designed were, were built in this time. 
And those of you who do coding, do you ever do something from scratch if there's some other way of doing it that's already been invented that you are familiar with? No, you would never bother reinventing something. You just control C, control V it. So when you're designing an operating system or designing a computer, you're going to start from things that have been done before. You're not going to take the time to reinvent things that are working perfectly well. But what's the downside of this from a security perspective? Well, the operating systems we use today are updated versions of what? So say Windows, what are we up to? Windows 10, Windows 11? I can never remember which one. Windows 10. So Windows 10 built on top of what? Eight, which built on top of what? Seven, which built on top of like, XP and then Vista, which built on top of like 98, which goes back to blah, 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 blah. So do people start to see where there's this potential worry here for security? If we go all the way back, let's just call it Windows 1. And Windows 1 was say, came along in 1985. What was, was Windows 1, the original uh, operating system for say the first Microsoft PC, was it worried about internet security? Was the software and the operating system designed to make sure that once the internet came, it was gonna be safe? No, it was not. Now, nowadays we have computers that are interconnected around the world, but they are built up on a physical set or a, a set of software designs that were originally designed for something very different. So in a certain sense, Computers were not designed to be internet secure. So basically, we're starting off with something that's imperfect for what we want it to do. And all of these more recent updates have been an attempt to take something which was never designed to be safe in the way we need it to be safe and turn it into something that's safe in the way we need it to be safe. It's basically what we started with is imagine the following. You now have to go across the Atlantic Ocean. You have to get on the ocean and you have to sail from New York to say, uh, I don't know, Paris. What would you choose to begin with? What would your choice of vehicle be? If nowadays you know this is what your job is, your physical choice of vehicle, you choose a plane or what's another option we might have? A boat. Would you choose a car? No, you would never choose a car. Why? Because cars don't drive across the ocean and they can't fly. So essentially what we have though is 1985, they built a perfect car. The car was beautiful, it ran great. But now as we've gradually gotten to now, what we have is a time in which we're no longer going from New York to New York. We're now going from New York to Paris, but we're starting with a car and because we began with a car, what we've essentially been doing now is trying to turn a car into a boat where you can get make a car into a good enough boat to get you to Paris, but it's never going to be that great. So does everyone understand this crazy analogy I'm coming up with for why it's the case that computer systems are so hard to keep secure? It's kind of hard to keep them secure because they were never designed to do what we're asking them to do now. And so we're kind of now trying to put on top of what was originally a system designed for one thing, a bunch of things that allow it to do something else. It's like now we're sticking the motor on the car and now we're trying to find ways to caulk the bottom of the car so it'll float better. And all of these are things that the person who originally designed the car never anticipated it doing. And while we can get it to work pretty well, it is not an ideal system for interconnectedness. So we've just, we're having to tack on a lot of safety things that were not there originally, which is why the computer system is so damn, another reason it's so damn insecure is it was never designed to do what we now use it to do. And so we have to find new ways of keeping it safe because the system itself was never designed to be safe in this way. Does that make sense, everyone? Well, I grab a sip of water. And so unlike a wall, which was designed to do one thing very well, we're basically trying to force the computer to do something it's not, which leaves these gaps in it. All right, there's two final things that I wanna bring up. 
which is uh, So there's two final things that are worth highlighting around uh, security. The first one is responsibility questions. And the second one is business pressures that surround cybersecurity. So what do I mean by responsibility questions? Well, last week we talked about the notion of responsibility. And what did we say responsibility was? In a moral sense or in like a legal sense, what is it for someone to be responsible for something? This was my thing with the paper cuts and the tax on the ground and the knifing and all that stuff. Should all sound mildly familiar. Yeah, taking ownership of actions and having intentions. So yeah, responsibility is a matter of you having to take responsibility or ownership for the actions that have occurred. So in the case of security, there's a question of who is responsible for keeping a system secure and who should step in to make sure that it's secure. So if we talk about, I'm gonna erase this so I have a little more, actually no, I don't need the board right now. Um, so in a physical location, who is responsible for keeping your apartment safe or your house safe? You are, exactly. You are responsible for keeping your own house safe. Now, let's go, imagine, um, let's just use Ford Car Company. Ford Car has a factory. Uh, they have a few of them, but let's just take, there's one, I think, down in like Virginia. So the Ford uh, factory in Virginia, who is responsible for keeping that physical factory secure? Who's responsible for locking the doors? The manager. And the manager who is part of, yeah, their employees, their manager, the company themselves. So if somebody forgets to lock the doors and someone breaks into the factory, whose fault is it and who gets punished and who takes the financial difficulties? So the security guard gets in trouble, whoever was responsible for the door. Here's the question, is the government responsible? Should the US government have to pay a lot of money to make sure the door is locked? No, there's no thought that the US government should step in and in any way be responsible for this. The idea is it's a private company, you should be responsible for your own security. However, there's a big issue now with computer systems. Now, why is this worth bringing up? Why is it that we now have a difference of responsibility? Well, let's think about the case in which someone breaks into the Ford factory. Who can be hurt by this? Who can be damaged if someone breaks into the Ford factory and starts stealing parts or breaking machines? Who's harmed by this? The owner is and the company is. Ford is going to be affected. However, now let's contrast this. Let's imagine a case in which we're not talking about the Ford factory being broken into. We're talking about, say, the Con Ed, uh, com the Con Ed Power Station Computer System. So the power grid is largely computerized. It's not like there's someone deciding from their house how much power to send to your house. There's not someone sitting there. It's all automated. So now imagine Con Ed, Con Edison, the major power provider in New York City. Now imagine that Con Ed is hacked into and somebody just shuts down the computer system in charge of these power stations. Um, and so for say five hours, there's a blackout in all of Manhattan. Five hour blackout, all of Manhattan, no power. 
who should be responsible for this? Who should be stepping in? So Sammy says the government. Why is there a difference here? What is the difference here between the Con Ed case and the Ford Motor Company case? One of them's computer break-in, the other's physical break-in, but they're both private companies. Why do we start to have a question of should the government step in? Involves many people. So this kind of goes back to our issue with the interconnectedness of computer systems. Because the computer system is so expansive and so spread out, what it means is if there's a hack in the computer system, it has the potential to affect a lot more people. And because of this, we no longer, it's no longer clear who should have the responsibility for keeping things safe. Should the government step in? But if the government steps in and decides we need to ensure that these systems are safe, what does the government need to do to ensure that it has the money to pay for these computer systems to be safe? What's going to have to increase? They're going to have to employ more people and more security. And what do you need to do those things? You can't employ more people, including security, unless you have more what? Money. Where does the government's money come from? How does the government make money? Taxes. What do people hate to pay? Taxes. Everyone hates paying taxes. So we've got this weird thing in which we're starting to realize that these private companies might need more assistance keeping their own network secure. But at the same time, we don't want to have to pay the tax increases that would do this. So there's this big issue here. Another issue is you might just say, well, if Con Ed wants to get into the power game in the modern world, they should have to pay this amount of money to make sure that their computer system is secure. If Con Ed wants to do this, we need to ensure that they keep their network secure and it should be their responsibility. But what is Con Ed gonna say in response to this? What, what is Con, if you say Con Ed, you need to spend money to make sure that you have the best possible. In fact, we want you to have a perfect security system on the, on the power grid. What are they gonna say to you? If you're the government and you say Con Ed, yeah, they're gonna say, we need more resources. They're just gonna say, we cannot afford to do that without some assistance. Because what is, and this ties into number seven, what is Con Ed's number one job? Even above providing power, even above anything else, what is the number one thing that Con Ed or Target or any company is trying to do? Make money. That is the nature of our modern world. The job of a company is to make money. That's what they exist for. Con Ed makes money by providing power, but the ultimate goal is to make the money from providing the power. So Con Ed is going to want to make sure that they don't spend so much money on security that they never make any money. Because if they never make any money, they're going to go out of business and then nobody's going to be providing the power. So what you need is you need to ensure that Con Ed provides enough, if they're in charge of it, they have a reason to provide enough security to keep the system safe, but they don't have a pressure to get the top of the line security system if that is too expensive for their business. If you have to if spend, if your profits each year are say $1 billion and your computer security system costs you 500 million, you're only making half as much. If by contrast, you could get away with a security system that costs only 100 million, then you're suddenly almost doubling your profit. So if this security system, even if it's not as good as the half a billion dollar one, if it's good enough that you can continue running, you have a reason as a company to get the cheaper security system. Does that make sense to everyone? Of just there's this pressure here where even if the public really would like the best, most expensive security system imaginable, economically speaking, there's pressures on companies not to spend all their resources on security systems. Even the most well-intentioned, most public uh, concerned company cannot afford in every case to get the most 
sophisticated cybersecurity system around if its goal is to turn the largest profits it can. So there's just these two pulling directions of even the most benign, kind company has some reason to try to keep their cybersecurity costs low. Does that make sense to everyone? Because even if you very much value it, and this is another issue with cybersecurity, when do you learn that your cybersecurity system wasn't good enough? When you get a virus and after an attack, you don't know your security system is not good enough until it's been damaged. So until you have seen it fail, you don't know whether it's fully successful or not. So one downside of this is when you are trying to sell a product, unless you are talking to security experts, you cannot really sell something on the back of it having the best security system. So if I show you the new Apple Watch, I can show you all its new features. If I show you the new iPhone, I can explain to my grandma all the cool new things it does, and she might want to buy it more than she did before. However, can I explain to her the new end-to-end -end encryption that is being used on all iMessages? Can I really get her to understand the value of that thing? Can I show her on the phone what end-to-end -end encryption looks like and why that's so valuable? No. Can I take a picture and show her how fucking great it looks? Yes, I can. So if I'm a company and my job and my goal is to get more people to buy my products. So I've got an iPhone and say I've got $50 million to spend as Apple. In this box, what I can do is improve camera. In this box, I improve encryption. Which is more likely, if my goal is to get more people to buy the iPhone and knowing what you do about the average computer user, which of these investing in better encryption or investing in a better camera is more likely to lead to more people buying the iPhone? The camera is because peep, the average person, this goes back to the lack of awareness, the average person cares and can be uh, convinced by a good camera, you need a certain level of expertise to understand why, no, I really want a phone with end-to-end -end encryption, or I really want a phone that has X, Y, and Z security measures. So companies have business pressures to put their resources into things other than security. So even if in the abstract, we really, really want better security systems, the average person doesn't know the difference before an attack happens of a phone with a great security system and a mediocre camera or one with a mediocre system and a great camera. They can see the difference between a great camera and a crappy camera. They can't see the difference between great security and bad security. So what they're far more likely to spend their money on and what's gonna get them motivated are the cool new gadgets that the phone has, which means that oftentimes, if there's a limited budget or limited time, what is one of the things that very often gets left behind or ignored in development? If budget is, is reduced, money is reduced, security is one of the first things that will get cut. Now, some companies are better than others. There are very um, honest, very reputable companies that will ensure that even if it's not directly affecting their bottom line, they will ensure that it is still top of the end security. But not every company is able to do that. And that doesn't always happen. So another thing you have to be aware of is even if a company has interest in security, um, they, yeah, they do a sanity test instead of an all security test. So yeah, people will, if corners get cut, very often it's in the security realm because security is less likely. When you tell like um, another one is if you're a startup, up company and you want to get new uh, venture capitalist investors too. So the way this works is, so just background, just general thing. Do people know what is meant by venture capital? I just want to make sure that uh, 
this is just going to be like a general life lesson thing to know about just to understand how very often startups work. Do people know what is meant by venture capital? Yeah, it's an investor. And what is an investor? How many of you have watched Shark Tank before? Has anyone watched Shark Tank, the show Mark Cuban's on it with some other people? Okay, so what do they do in Shark Tank? What is the what happens on that show? They pitch out who's they. So yeah, it's basically so somebody comes along with a great idea. So uh, anyone know what I'm drawing right now? It's the most successful thing ever to appear on Shark Tank. Yeah, the Scrub Daddy sponge. The Scrub Daddy is the number one most successful product to ever appear on Shark Tank. So what did they do? These people invented this thing. And what they did is they said, we need more money to make our company run better. So you people in front of us, the sharks, who are very wealthy people with a large amount of money, basically what this person does, they own 100% of the company when they walk in the room, but they say have only $50,000 in cash and you can't produce things without cash. So what these people will do is they will walk over here to the venture capitalist, and this is like Mark Cuban and uh, all the other people that are on that show. Uh, I can never remember their names. The guy from FUBU and uh, the queen of QVC and all the other people who, uh, Mr. Wonderful and all the other venture capitalists. What they do is they say, we will give you 20% of our company so that in the future, 20% of anything we make, you will get. And in exchange, you give us say $300,000 right now so that we can invest it into producing more sponges. Because right now, we don't have the cash to make these sponges. You give us these cash, you will get a portion of our company. So that down, what the venture capitalists are thinking is, all right, I will give away some money now in the hopes that down the line, when this company blows up, I will be getting 20% of millions of dollars a year, and then I will make more money than I put in. But the, so to do this, you have to pitch your idea and convince this company why your product is such a good one. And startups do this all the time. So if you're inventing a new app, you go to a venture capitalist and you say, this is what my app's going to do. This is all the problems it's going to solve. It's going to tell you, um, we can imagine the Uber people doing it. We're going to have an app where you can ask for a cab without having to stand out there and you'll be able to follow your route. Also, people will be able to get a job working for this company without X, Y, and Z. What they're, so those are the sorts of things you sell to venture capitalists. What's one thing that your average venture capitalist isn't going to be able to understand or give a damn about? What is something that if you go up there and start giving in your pitch for your app, they're probably just going to glaze over and be like, I don't follow, I don't care. You invent an app. Your app is Uber. What is the point of Uber? What is the thing? Yeah, so Uber, the goal of Uber, it's um, about cars. So if you're trying to get a venture capitalist in on this, you're talking about cars the whole time. You're not talking about the back end IT and you're especially not gonna spend the time and resources on the security of it. Because early on, what's gonna get you off the ground is that you can get people getting cars quickly and effectively. It's not until down the line that you have to start worrying about, are people going to hack into my system? So early on, much of the money is get ignoring all the um, security stuff and going into making the app do what it's designed to do better. So even in a company, very often, with, if it's a small company that goes up, security gets neglected until it becomes a big issue. So that's another reason tied in with this, of there are these business pressures having to do with venture capital and investment that lead companies to, instead of putting in a lot of effort, trying to make sure that their security systems are as good as possible, they instead just make sure the app runs well and then worry about the security later, which means that we have large numbers of apps that by the time they get big and become a target, don't have the best security systems in line. All right, does that, so all of that makes sense to everyone. All those six, seven different reasons that, Cybersecurity is so damn hard. So, if that's the issue, what the hell can you do about it? 
What is the best way if all of these problems exist and none of them are going away? What can you personally do to make sure that your computer is safe and to make sure that other people's computers that you're connected to are safe? Well, what's step number one? Learn about security and how to implement it. And what's the first step about learning about security? What's the first, and I'm not gonna be able to teach you the technical details, but we can go over one of the first steps, which is if you want to, so imagine, um, imagine someone approaches you on the street and picks a fight with you. Um, they throw a punch at your face. What's step one to blocking the punch? How do you, what's the, before you can do anything else, what do you have to do with your hands? Or before you can even do anything with your hands, what do you need to do? Before you can know, so you put them in front of your face. Yes, but before you can defend yourself, imagine they just swing a punch and you want to block that punch. What's step number one? You put your hands here. Yeah, you have to see it coming. You have to know where it's coming from. If someone's trying to punch you in the stomach, you don't put your hands up here. If someone's trying to punch you in the face, you don't put them down here. In the same way, one of the first steps in getting to know cybersecurity and keeping your own personal stuff safe is to know what attacks look like. What types of attacks are there? So I just want to spend the end of class. I don't know how much of the rest of this time we're going to be using just talking about some of the types of attacks there are and what you can do to keep yourself and your company and anything safe from this. So what are some of the different types of ways in which your computer can be hacked into or in which your computer can be made unsafe? And some of these you don't have control over entirely and others you can protect yourself from. So what are some of the ways in which computer systems are hacked into or broken into or people who shouldn't gain access to your computer get access to it? And this is opening up to anything you want to talk about, anything to a physical attack. Describe a physical attack, Kevin. What do we mean here? Yeah, so a person can physically go to your computer and install whatever they want. So one thing to do, so uh, physical install, basically simply put, and this one is just like, comes in, don't let somebody get on your computer if you don't trust them or know who they are. Don't just let strangers onto your computer. Don't leave your computer unattended in a public library. These ones are a little like pretty common sensey. What are some other ways in which, but just because it's common sense doesn't mean you shouldn't be fully aware of this. People will try to ask you to get onto your computer. And if you don't know this person, be careful. Just like odds are that if a stranger asks you to use your computer, they're not going to try to install something, but they might be. So just be careful. What are some other ways in which these things can happen? What are some other types of attacks? A network attack. What do we mean here by a network attack? Uh, so yeah, DDoS. Do people know what a DDoS or a DDoS attack is? A denial of service attack. And so basically what a DDoS is, is um, a case in which, does anyone want to describe how a DDoS works? It's another one that attacks the accessibility part of security. It basically disrupts your service that you cannot use anymore. It's like um, a lot of services are coming so you can use anything. Exactly. So yeah, the idea is each computer system can handle a certain amount of things because it's the, like a network. You can think of it as like a fiber optic cable connected to like the servers. And because it's a physical thing, it can only handle a certain amount of information coming to it at once. It's the same thing as what happens if like, you know, what happens to you when you're trying to talk to four people at once, you just get overloaded and can't do anything. 
So in the same way, what a DDoS attack will do is you just have a huge number of computers all at the same time trying to access the same website or same um, server or same anything like that. So if you decide that like, I don't like this government official, you can use large numbers of computers to try to simultaneously approach that computer. So what will end up happening is if you have, say, 10 million people at the same time trying to go to uh, JoeBiden.com, Joe Biden's website will not be able to handle that traffic and will get shut down. Usually, it'll be able to, big companies will be able to bring it back up. But the downside of this is that if the if it's something like a credit card company or Amazon, they will lose large amounts of money because for the whole time they're down, you aren't able to access their website or purchase anything. So with DDoS attacks, there's not really that much the average person can do other than just like the best way to not get DDoSed is not be important enough to get DDoSed. So, um, but just being aware that this sort of thing can happen. Um, and if something you try to get to a website and it's not working, just be aware that, that might be what's going on. Um, a virus. So what do we mean by a computer virus? What is a computer virus? Or a Trojan, which type another type of program, which is usually thought of as a, a worm. So what are viruses and worms? Yeah, there's pieces of software that are designed to look like legitimate pieces of software, but they actually do something malicious. So for instance, a Trojan will be something like, um, you can have them put onto like a Word document. It looks like a normal Word document, but in the Word document, there are some lines of code that will do something malicious to your computer. Same thing, viruses are self-replicating where once they're into the computer system, they will spread to other computers within the network. So what's the best way to keep yourself safe from viruses and Trojans? An antivirus is one, which prevents you, once it's on your computer, it can help you identify, or what it can do is once your computer is, uh, once you have the file in front of you, your computer can scan that file to make sure that that thing is what it says it is. But the best thing to do is be aware and don't just download things that you don't know where they come from. Make sure what you're downloading is safe. So for instance, um, even if it's something that, the other thing with Trojans and viruses is, is that the person who's sending it to you might not be aware that what they're sending you has malicious software. So just even always be aware and be careful when you're downloading programs and never click something on an unknown website or link. And so being aware of these emails that are coming from someone, always be careful when opening your emails, even if you get thousands, if you don't know what it's coming from, it's better to be safe than sorry. Uh, or if it's written in a slightly weird way, better to be safe than sorry, which ties into another type of one, which is phishing. What is phishing? With a PH, not the F. Uh, send in a, a link to, to someone that will be like sent to a fake page that looks like a legit one where yeah. they get their information. Yeah, so what basically phishing is, is somebody, what do you do when you're actual physical phishing with an F? What you're trying to do is you throw out something in the water, see if anything bites, and then you reel it in. That's the same idea with phishing emails. What you do is you send out an email that looks like it is um, authentic or genuine, but then what you ask for are things that, uh, so you'll say like, hi, this is your credit card company. You are, uh, there's been a recent change to your information and we need to ensure that you have the correct password. Please re-enter your password. So if you get this email and you go to a website, it looks like say Citibank, but what it will actually be is a scam website, a fake website designed to look like this, the uh, Citibank website. And when you type in your username and your password, what actually happens? Where does that username and password go? Does it go into Citibank's computers? No, where does it actually go? A server of somebody who's not Citibank, who will save that information so that later 
they will then take this, or yeah, it'll go into a database of all this information so that later this person can then try to get on to Citibank using your account information. This is called phishing. And phishing has become much more of a problem because, well, there's two reasons that it's tied in with computers. So computers have phishing attacks of some sort have always taken place. Phishing attacks have become much more common though because of several different reasons. Well, one of them is the nature of email. What is it about the nature of email that makes phishing attacks much more easy to do than they used to be? Can anyone guess what's the difference? So imagine a hundred years ago, I wanted to, well, let's just go with like the most classic phishing example ever, um, which is the uh, Nigerian prince phishing scam. Have people heard of the Nigerian prince scam? What is the Nigerian prince scam? How does that work? Yeah, so you basically get an email of somebody that says, hi, I'm a Nigerian prince. I've been illegally and unfairly kicked out of my nation by the new government. I need just $1,000 to get back in, and then I'm going to help uh, install a new government. Once I get in place, I will be able to give you $100,000. Please just give me these $1,000, and I promise I'll pay you a hundred grand in return. So... These sorts of things have existed for a long time. You can have cases in which, like I could go around a hundred years ago claiming to be a Nigerian prince, pre please give me a thousand dollars. But why is it much more common to see a scam like the Nigerian prince scam today than it used to be in the past? Somebody already gave one of the answers. I can't remember who and I'm too lazy to scroll up. So whoever said the thing about anonymity and uh, whatever, say it feel free to say it again. And I want to give you credit for it. Who was that? Okay, I will scroll up. Who said less? Daniel. Daniel said less human interaction. So that's one difference. Why does that matter? What is it? If I were to walk up to you on the street, how quickly would you be able to identify that I was not a Nigerian prince? Yeah. Yeah. You look at me right now. Do I look or sound like a Nigerian prince would? Or would you be immediately skeptical? Like the moment you saw me, you'd be skeptical that I was a Nigerian prince. Like seems very unlikely given what I look like. If, however, I send you an email that says I'm a Nigerian prince, how quickly can you identify whether or not, how certain are you immediately that I'm not a Nigerian prince? Seems unlikely but it's a little more likely than when you look me straight in the eye and see that I do not look like somebody who is a prince or from West Africa. So exactly, you can't be 100% sure if you're not interacting face to face. And then what's the other major difference? If I wanted to send, if I wanted to try the Nigerian prince scheme on every single one of you, but it was the year 1900, what would I have to do? How would I pull off the Nigerian prince scheme in the year 1900? I'd have to send letters. So what would that involve? What are all the steps in sending a letter? I'd have to hand write a bunch of letters. I'd have to find your addresses. I'd have to, so how long would it take to write out a letter? Like how many of you actually physically write letters anymore? I certainly don't. But it sure as hell takes a lot longer than typing one email. And that's the other major difference. Nowadays, if you want to send the, the Nigerian print scheme to 100,000 people at once, how long does that take you? One second. You have to write an email, copy and paste a bunch of email addresses, and hit send. That allows people to send these phishing schemes against thousands and thousands and thousands of people very, very quickly. So that's another issue is it's just so much easier to do these phishing schemes that you are far more likely to run into them. It also means that you have to be on your guard much more often. 
So how do you prevent yourself from phishing schemes? What's the best way to ensure that you aren't getting scammed in these cases? Yeah, learn about them. Don't just agree to give money to things you don't understand. Whenever you're buying a new product online, what should you do? What should you do before you say you get an email that says, come and buy this new product? What should you do before it sounds perfect for you? What Do your research. Yeah, it's time consuming. It's exhausting, but it can save you a huge headache in the long run. Also, if somebody calls you out of the blue and is saying something that doesn't sound 100% true, be careful. Don't just agree to things, especially on the computer and the internet. Um, another thing is related to phishing is I'm going to put up five. Spear phishing. Do people know what spear phishing is? either in the sense of spear phishing or spear phishing. So what is, so regular phishing, how do you do it? Like with a rod and a reel. So yeah, that's the key difference here. Yeah, so when you're fishing, generally speaking, with an actual fishing rod, you're just trying to catch whatever will bite your line. You're not directed at a particular fish. If it bites it, you'll pull it in. That's that. When you're, do people know what spear fishing is as an actual like thing? Yeah. So when you're spear fishing, you have like this like high powered air gun with a spear attached to it, and you're swimming under the water, and you identify a particular fish, and then you shoot the gun at that particular fish. So spear phishing in the pH sense is the same sort of thing. You're not just sending a ton of emails trying to get somebody to agree to it. You're instead sending one very targeted email at a particular person to try to get them to give you a particular piece of information. And what makes spear phishing very deadly is that it's, if you're doing a spear phishing attack, you can make it much more catered towards the person you're aiming it for. And so spear phishing ties in with social engineering. And so spear phishing is really a type of social engineering carried out on email. So what is social engineering? Yeah, social engineering is basically in, what you do is instead of hacking into a computer or anything like that, you put a person in a, so, you engineer a social situation and put social pressures on someone so that that person gives you the information you want them to give you, but they give it voluntarily, not realizing that they've been scammed. So it's a sort of case where like, if you have a virus or something like that, you're just downloading a program. There, nobody's attached like approaching you via your psychology. But in a social engineering experiment, what you'll do is you'll approach someone pretending to be someone that is the sort of person that would approach them. So for instance, if I know that you really, really love the New York Yankees and I've been trying to get Yankees tickets all year and haven't been able to do it, then I might call you pretending to be somebody with the New York Yankees selling discount tickets to CUNY students. And I'll say, I just need your a quick credit card information and all the this, and your tickets will arrive next week. So because I know about you, what you like, what you enjoy doing, and what sorts of things you're looking for, I am able to engineer a situation in which you are going to be more likely to respond to me than you would if I claimed I'm a Nigerian prince. So does that idea make sense? This idea of you cater an email or you cater a spam call to direct it specifically at a certain person. So for instance, I got a spam call the other day that was asking me to get the to change the warranty on my car. I don't have a car in my name. So I immediately knew that this was a scam. If, however, somebody had called me saying something about uh, an issue with my information at, at uh, John Jay, and decided to uh, that I had to write in to like an at John Jay email address, then it starts to really be much more persuasive. So 
Has anyone heard of other types of spear phishing or social engineering cases that they want to bring up? Because these ones can be really, really deadly. So an IRS scam is a really good one. Yeah, where somebody claims to be the IRS. Um, a FAFSA scam, basically any sort of case in which it's someone claiming to be a government organization. Um, there are ones these days that claim that there's a warrant out for your arrest and you need to give information. Um, Social security number calls, yeah, anything of this sort. So basically, yeah, an FBI scam call. The thing you should always do these days is if you get a call from one of these, and the reason they often go with these sort, well, why do scammers go with these like high powered organizations? Why do they say they're the FBI? Yeah, they put fear in you. The goal is to make you scared so that you're more likely to do something quickly without thinking. So with spear phishing or anything like that, always pause and ask yourself, why would somebody, is there really anything I need to be worried about? And before you respond, look up whether this is something that is going around. Because very often an FBI scam call or an IRS scam will be something that comes in cycles. So just Google search IRS scam or look up whether this is the sort of call the FBI would actually make. So before you go through all the legwork, and always, whenever these things happen, if you get an email from the FBI, just try to stay calm. Odds are you did not commit anything the FBI would be interested in. Uh, maybe you did, but even so, the odds that they would email you about it or call you about it and leave a voicemail are quite low. Just be careful, keep a cool head. Other things to be aware of is spear phishing will often these days involve um, emails from your boss. Yeah, your cousin got an FBI call and he's seven years old. So these are the sorts of things where like, if anything is at all fishy, be aware of it. Just look for fishiness. Don't like ask yourself, is this at all reasonable? I'm 19 years old and I haven't broken the law since I was like 14 and I vandalized the car. Would they really come and get me right now? Is the FBI really going to be interested in this? Just stay calm. Like, ask yourself, is this reasonable? Another thing to be aware of is spear phishing these days, very commonly, spear phishing attacks will come from somebody impersonating your boss. So you'll get an email from your boss or a text from your boss, which will say, I need you hey, we need to make some purchases on Amazon. Would you buy like $1,000 in Amazon gift cards? We get a better deal if we do it through gift cards. And then we'll go, just send me those gift cards and we'll use them to buy uh, all the toilet paper we need for the office this month. Be, just ask yourself, is this really the sort of thing my boss would be emailing me about? Another thing to be very careful around with spear phishing is always check the email you're receiving it from very, very, very closely. Um, so for instance, I also teach at Baruch and I've gotten emails from my department chair, but it was an email that was designed to look like his email and had a picture of him that they had found through a Google search, but was not an email of his. So it was instead of like his actual email address, let's just say as J Smith at baruch.cuny.edu, what this email address was, was jsmithbaruch.baruch.cuny.edu at gmail.com. So if I'm not looking closely, those two email addresses can look very similar. But you have to always be careful. Of, is this really the email address? Is this actually the person's email address? And if you have any questions, just reach out to them. Even if your boss is cranky, it's, they will be much less cranky if you ask them, is this email actually from you? Than they would be if you managed to get scammed by somebody who's pretending to be your boss. So just be aware, this is another really common way that spear phishing is happening. And why is spear phishing becoming so much more common? It used to be that phishing attacks were just about the only type of these social engineered email attacks that could happen. But nowadays, spear phishing has become much more, much, much, much more common. 
Anyone know what it is that's fundamentally changed it? Why is it that spear phishing is much more common than it was 10 years ago? What has changed? What has risen and become a part of our daily lives much more than it was 10 years ago? So we're always using our emails as a big one. So just the number of emails we're receiving, we're much easier to access. And why are we easier to access with emails? How come people are more able to get access to your email? The internet is everywhere. And what aspect of the internet has changed in the past 15 years? Anyone know, um, what is your mother, whenever your mother finds a news story, so one thing is our emails are signed up for websites and the number of websites has just exploded. So the access to the number of emails is much more. But why is it that companies have been able to target the emails? So for instance, I um, just right now looking around, let's see if looking at these pages. Now, none of you have anything too uh, easy to give away. Yeah, there's nothing too much here. Um, but generally speaking, why is it that I can learn a lot about you and use it in a spear phishing attack today? And I might not have been able to do it. 50 yeah, social media apps. That is a major change. I can find out just about anything I want to know enough to write a spear phishing email based on your social media. If your Instagram is not private, I can pretty quickly figure out what your hobbies are. And if I know what your hobbies are, I know how to pose as somebody who is in the business of those hobbies. If you're a huge Yankees fan, I can find that out pretty quickly and use that information. If I see a picture of you standing in front of the John Jay uh, front building with your, fr the front of the John Jay building with your friends, I now know I can pose as a John Jay um, IT person. If I see you and see you sitting in front of like, uh, or like, if I see on your Instagram, there's a lot of pictures of cars. I now know you really like cars. I can use that to my advantage. So basically, one of the downsides of social media is that it makes you a much easier target for any type of spear phishing attack. So always be aware that if, if you get an email from someone you've never heard of, and they have approached you about one of your hobbies or your job or something like that, ask yourself, is there some other way this person could have used that and figured out that information? May they have found this about me on my LinkedIn? May they have found this out about me on my Facebook? Might they have just found it by Instagram? May it be that I signed up for a certain website that was recently hacked? All of these sorts of things you have to ask yourself. And generally speaking, the less you put on social media, the harder it is for anyone to get information about you. So the less you have on there, the, you, you don't want to put so little on social media that it makes you miserable. If you're somebody who really values social media, you should not stop putting things on social media. However, you also want to not document every single thing on your social media or else what ends up happening is you are basically just giving someone a here's how to hack me list. Does that make sense to everyone about how these things weren't possible back before everyone was on Facebook? All right. The final two I want to talk about are uh, password cracking uh, and man in the middle attacks. So what password cracking is, and this is something we talked about, all password cracking is, is just guessing the password correctly. So one of the simplest ways to get on is just to guess someone's password. So one of the best things to do to make sure that you're not password cracked is have good passwords. And that is, and this is again about finding the balance between passwords that are easy enough to remember, but also passwords that aren't going to be easy for anyone to guess. And this one's just kind of common sense, but things like don't make your password password. At least don't make it password if it's something you give a damn about. Um, don't make your password one, two, three, four, five. Don't make it the same password for every single thing you have. Have at least a few different passwords. So uh, don't display your password in public. Don't text your password to somebody's email or to someone's phone if you don't trust that that person is someone you necessarily know. Just be safe around password cracking. 
And then the last one I want to talk about before we get going are man in the middle. And this is a newer type of attack that's worth talking about. How many people have heard of man in the middle attacks? So what is a man in the middle attack? Anyone think they can describe it? Well, yeah. So here's the basic idea. This is you. You're sitting at a lap with your laptop in a Starbucks. You're on the Starbucks Wi-Fi network, their public Wi-Fi network, which means that here's their router. We'll just draw a little box. Their, their Wi-Fi network hooked up to the router. It looks like this. This is Starbucks. So, and then let's just have uh, Amazon servers. So you are on, you are buying things on Amazon via the Starbucks Wi-Fi network. How does this go? What does it look like? Well, here's you. When you go to the website, what happens? When you type in amazon.com on the Starbucks public Wi-Fi network, which looks like this, what actually happens technologically speaking? Well, your computer sends packets of information to this Wi-Fi network. So here's your packets of information. They go this way, doop, doop. and then once it goes here, the Wi-Fi network, the router then directs it onwards via the more general internet connections to the Amazon servers. Then the Amazon servers will take your request, send that information back to the Starbucks Wi-Fi, which will then send it back to you, and it'll say you now have one box of tissues in your Amazon account or in your cart. So that's the way it works. It goes. Doop. Now, what a man in the middle attack essentially does is it just somebody gets in the middle of these transfers. So basically what somebody will do is instead of sending this information directly to the Starbucks Wi-Fi, they will set up something here in which they, they, they change some IP addresses around or they change, they set up something so that... Um, Instead of sending your information directly to the Starbucks Wi-Fi, what happens is your information goes to somebody else's computer that is pretending to be the Starbucks Wi-Fi. And this computer will then look at what is being sent and will then send this information onto the Starbucks Wi-Fi, but after having collected any information it wants. So if you are entering a password, into say your Amazon, this person will read your password, will read what you've entered and then send it onward. So now they record what your username and password are. And they might not stop this exchange from happening. It's just that the next time, once you leave, you can then, they can take this information that you typed in and use it to access your Amazon. Yeah, it's like a key logger. A key logger is something that will uh, basically you install it and it will record every single thing that has been typed in on your keyboard and give that information to someone. So if like you see the same like eight letter phrase over and over again, it's quite possible that that's a password. Um, so the idea is though, and the way that man in the middle attacks generally happen is it's very easy on an unsecured, if you have the technical expertise on an unsecured Wi-Fi network, to set up one of these types of man in the middle setups. So somebody with a laptop and who knows what they're doing, who goes to Starbucks or goes to Barnes and Noble or anything that's not password protected can be set up and from that Wi-Fi network set up one of these collection sites. Um, so one of the main takeaways about man in the middle attacks is just don't do things of, that involve personal information especially credit cards, bank accounts, anything like that from an unsecured public Wi-Fi network. Because there could be someone on that network monitoring everything that you're doing. They may have set it up so that you don't even realize that before your information goes on to the actual router, it's being collected by somebody else. So for instance, don't use the MTA Wi-Fi network to like do your banking. There's a chance that somebody sitting in the uh, 
the subway station is collecting your information. Don't do your banking in a Starbucks. There's a chance somebody is collecting that information. Only do it on password protected networks. Um, so does that make sense to everybody about like how this idea works? It's literally you just, you basically claim it. It's imagine that uh, every time you sent a package, UPS opened it up, looked inside and then took any information that was written before moving it onwards. It's the same idea here. This person looks inside your packet, sees what you're passing onwards, collects anything they want, and that's that. Um, so that's how a man in the middle attack works. So the main takeaway I want you to have today is that cybersecurity is very difficult, even from a general level. Even somebody who doesn't have the technical expertise, you can appreciate that there's a lot working against you keep keeping your network secure. And because of this, you have to be aware of the types of attacks that are occur and always be vigilant and safe, especially with your work computers. You can entirely cripple your company if you open the wrong type of email. Just always be aware, always be safe. Just constantly, if you assume that people are trying to come after you, uh, then you can be safer. But you, I mean, it's exhausting to assume that all the time. But whenever you get an email, look and see who it's coming from. Just be aware, program it into your brain, and just try to stay safe. All right. So I have no more things I want to talk about today. Does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns about anything we discussed today, what we'll be doing next time, anything like that? All right. If no one has any questions, I'm going to stop the recording, tell everyone to have a great weekend, and say see you next Friday.